be here with us and give a talk on the breaking and replay, repairing human chromosome mechanisms and diseases. Thank, uh, please welcome Professor Kate Caldicott. Okay, well thank you. Um, on behalf of um, the University of Sussex and also being the first speaker from Sussex, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dean Scorn and also our hosts for what's been a fantastic visit in actual fact and hopefully some very fruitful collaborations will emerge from it. So the, uh, many, many of my colleagues at the school are interested in this molecule shown here which is of course DNA, DNA double helix and we're particularly interested in how DNA becomes damaged which it does far more frequently than many people appreciate. I mean we often consider DNA to be a stable molecule, it is of course the unit of heredity. But in actual fact, DNA is damaged at least uh, tens of thousands of times per cell per day. And if those um, sites of DNA damage are not effectively repaired, it can clearly lead to human disease, as hopefully my talk and uh, Alan Lehman's talk will illustrate today. So DNA damage arises from a variety of sources. It's, it's unavoidable, so it arises from endogenous reactive molecules that arise because of aerobic metabolism in our cells. So reactive oxygen species will attack DNA very readily. It also results from uh, molecules and sources of DNA damage in our environment. So for example, ultraviolet radiation from the sun, from X-ray radiation from sources like radon, medical X-rays, also from contaminants in foodstuffs. So molecules and contaminants in, in um, food that we ingest can go on to damage DNA if not, if not um, metabolized appropriately. So the types of damage, this, this is a very simplistic cartoon in terms of the types of damage that arise in cells, but it's quite nice in that it illustrates some of, the, some of the major concepts. So for example, you can have relatively small chemical modifications to DNA bases, shown in red here. You can have bulky modifications which tend to distort the DNA double helix, and uh, Professor Lehman will talk about this type of damage, uh, particularly as a source arising from the ultraviolet radiation. You can have damage that covalently cross-links the double helix together, and of course that causes real problems when you try and separate the strands to replicate DNA or to transcribe and, and conduct gene expression. The types of damage that my laboratory are particularly are interested in, however, are um, the ones shown on the left here, which is a, a scission of one strand of the helix, a single strand break, or a scission of both strands, a double strand break. And we know from the presence of a variety of rare hereditary diseases that if you lose the capacity to repair either single strand breaks or double strand breaks, that can lead to human disease. And one of the most um, striking pathologies that emerges from, from individuals who have defects in single strand break repair or double strand break repair is uh, neurological um, problems. So a neurodegeneration arises. There can be neurodevelopmental problems such as seizures and, and microcephaly, which is a smaller than normal head circumference. And the same with double strand breaks, microcephaly, developmental delay, neurodegeneration. Of course, in the case of double strand breaks, there's also a strong linkage to um, cancer predisposition as well. But I'm not really going to talk about cancer today. I'm going to focus on these neurological um, um, symptoms. What I want to do is spend about 10 to 15 minutes telling you about the work that we've done, or at least summarizing the work we've done in trying to understand how single strand breaks are repaired, so that's the molecular mechanism, then highlighting how defects in that pathway lead to neurological disease, and presenting you at the end of that section with a model for why we think single strand breaks result in neurological disease. And then for the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'll talk about double strand breaks in a similar way. So I'll talk about a particular type of double strand break, how we think it's repaired, and what happens if we don't repair it effectively in humans, how it impacts on human health. So, in terms of single strand breaks then, um, I'm just going to overview our current working model for how these lesions are repaired. And this, is, this, has been, this model is built up from more than 10 years research now in my lab and, and many other laboratories, so it's a sort of overview if you like. And one of the key aspects of single strand breaks that arise particularly from oxidative stress. So this is particularly from reactive oxygen species coming from, say, mitochondria, uh, is that the, the break has these uh, 
damaged DNA termini. So these little two red blobs here are meant to denote the fact that the chemistry of those breaks is incorrect. If you want to repair the break, the chemistry must be a 3' prime hydroxyl group and a 5' prime phosphate group. And you need those, those chemistries for um, DNA polymerases to replace any missing information at the break. So often there is, a, there is a nucleotide missing here. And you need DNA ligases to be able to rejoin the strands together. And for that, you need 5' prime phosphate group. So one of the major steps of this repair process is to remove these red blobs and replace them with the appropriate chemistry. And you'll see just how important that step is in, in a few minutes. So the first step of repair then is detection. And there's a protein called polyADP ribose polymerase 1. There's a very abundant protein in nuclei in human cells. It's chromatin bound and it senses these breaks very rapidly. And when it binds to them, it introduces a 90 degree kink in the DNA molecule. PARP is then activated at those breaks. It utilizes NAD and synthesizes a polymer called polyADP ribose, which is a highly negatively charged polymer um, that is a, has a nucleic, nucleic acid type structure. And it forms these sorts of um, long polymeric branch chains, both on itself and on other proteins in the vicinity of the break, for example, histones. That modification serves as a signal to the cell that there is a single strand break at this, this particular position in a chromosome, and that serves to recruit a scaffolding factor called XRCC1. And XRCC1 is constitutively bound to a partner protein called DNA ligase 3, and this protein is very important for the last stage of repair. XRCC1's role, however, is as a protein interaction motif. It sits there and recruits all of the factors needed for the enzymatic steps of the repair process. During this step of repair and processing, it's the job of these four enzymes to remove these red blobs and replace them with the correct chemistry. Because the chemistry in these red blobs is so diverse, that's to say, is depending on the source of the break will depend on the chemistry of that terminus, you need a variety of different enzymatic activities. Once the chemistry has been restored to a 3' prime hydroxyl 5' prime phosphate, then the next step of repair can occur, which is to replace any missing information using DNA polymerases, and that can involve either insertion of a single nucleotide. Usually there's only one nucleotide missing at this break, so what insertion of a missing nucleotide is sufficient. Sometimes, however, the cell chooses to use something called a long patch process and insert multiple nucleotides. That requires displacement of the intact strand which is removed or cleaved by this nuclease of M1. But once you've replaced the missing information and you've removed any um, ex, uh, unwanted information, then you can reseal the break using a DNA ligase. For the short patch pathway, ligase 3 is used. For the long patch pathway, a different DNA ligase is used. So it's a relatively fast, highly efficient pathway, um, but in terms of the enzymes involved, it's also quite complex. So in terms of disease, there are th currently three neurodegenerative diseases associated with defects in this pathway. And in each case, the protein that's mutated is a protein involved in the DNAM processing step. So spinal cerebellar attacks with axonal neuropathy 1 results from mutations in TDP1. Microcephaly with early onset seizures results from mutations in PNK. And ataxia ocular motor apraxia 1 results from mutations in this protein apataxin. And each of these proteins processes a different type of terminus. All three of these are associated with um, recessive neurodegeneration, and in particular in the case of SCAN1 and AOA1 with degeneration of the cerebellum. And you can see here the degenerated cerebellum in the patient compared to a normal patient. What this means is that these patients have a problem with balance. They have a motor coordination problem because the cerebellum is the part of the brain that controls motor coordination and often they become wheelchair bound in early adolescence. So this is a severe disease, but largely restricted to the cerebellum. In the case of the third disease, microcephaly with early onset seizures, then there is a slightly broader pathology. In addition to, in addition to um, ataxia, these patients have microcephaly, so they have a small than normal head circumference. This is the patient here. This is a normal individual, and they have seizures. So in this disease, we think in addition to the progressive neurodegeneration seen in the cerebellum, there is also a neurodevelopmental problem. And the reason we have a neurodevelopmental problem in this disease, we think, is because that PNK is a much more important end processing factor than either TDP1 or apataxin. And that's simply because the, 
the types of damage terminus that PNK processes are more common than the types of terminus that are processed by either TDP1 or apotaxin, and hence we think a more severe disease. So what I want to do now is give you some idea of how we think single strand breaks actually manifest in, in a neuronal um, pathology. How do they result in neuronal cell death? Well, there are three possible ways we think about this. Firstly, if a single strand break persists long enough and you try and replicate this piece of DNA, then you will, the replication fork that's replicating the DNA, so the nascent strands here, you can see the two sister chromatids emerging from the replication fork, you can see that one of the sister chromatids is now completely broken because the, uh, the DNA polymerase has run into the single strand break. So this generates a double strand break, which is a highly cytotoxic lesion. This, of course, is an event occurring in proliferating cells, so we imagine this may, may be one of the major sources by which single strand breaks kill neuroprogenitor cells, and it may account for why there are neurodevelopmental defects in patients with very severe single strand break disorders. There are, of course, consequences to um, single strand breaks in non-proliferating cells. One of them is overactivation of this DNA repair enzyme, PARP1, which is the sensor molecule for single strand breaks. If PARP1 if a single strand break persists for too long, then PARP1 becomes overactivated. And because it uses NAD as a substrate to make those chains of poly ADP ribose, it depletes the cell's NAD um, um, component. That results in an imbalance in energy, in energy maintenance and energy metabolism. ATP levels go down and the cell ultimately dies. So overactivation of this sensor molecule results in cell death if the, if the single strand break persists, persists too long. Another way that we think is significant um, in terms of how single strand breaks might result in neural cell death is shown here, and that is if the single strand break is present in an active gene and an RNA polymerase is moving through this gene to generate a nascent RNA shown in green here, then in the same way that a DNA polymerase will struggle to get past a single strand break, an RNA polymerase will struggle to get past a single strand break. So ultimately what can happen here is that the single strand break can prevent gene expression you could result in loss of essential transcripts, or there may even be active signaling pathways that detect this kind of problem and trigger cell death. And because both of these two events are occurring in a replication-independent fashion, we imagine that they are the, probably the major way in which single strand breaks translate into neural cell death in post-mitotic neurons. So this may account for the progressive degenerative aspect of the pathologies that I mentioned. And I want to spend a little bit more time talking about this middle one because this middle one is very intriguing in that the RNA polymerase, when it encounters single strand break, has a particular problem if the break has these damaged termini. And I've already shown you that the three recessive diseases that we know about so far that arise from defects in single strand break repair do so because of defects in, that, in the ability of the cell to remove these red blobs. So this is a very important step. And we know that... The, because RNA polymerases struggle with this type of chemistry at the break, that this guilt by association, if you like, suggests that this type of structure may, be a, may pose a, a real problem for post-mitotic neurons. And it's not only repair that we think might be needed here. In addition to repair, it's important that this nascent RNA is maintained in a stable state while the, while the DNA repair event um, is occurring. So we imagine that it might also be important for RNA processing enzymes to be recruited to this site of damage and to prevent, for example, premature splicing, premature polyadenylation, and instability of the nascent transcript. So we really started asking questions about the RNA processing component of these diseases at an experimental level when we noticed that one of the diseases we've been studying, AOA1, was very similar in pathology to a second disease called AOA2. I'm going to tell you a little bit about AOA2 now. So AOA2 has the same pathology as AOA1. It has neurodegeneration, uh, progressive degeneration of the cerebellum, but in this case, the disease is due to a, a mutation of a protein called senataxin. And senataxin is not a DNA repair protein. Senataxin is an RNA processing factor. It's a, a, an RNA DNA helicase, and its role uh, is to unwind DNA RNA hybrids, a, a structure known as an R, R loop, at sites of stalled RNA polymerase activity during the termination of transcription. So one way in which RNA pol 2 terminates transcription is at the end of a gene it encounters a G-rich stretch that causes polymerase stalling. An R loop is formed and that allows the poly A 
uh, signal to be recognized and cleaved. And it's the job of cenotaxin to make sure that that RNA-DNA hybrid that, that, that's generated, it cites the stalled RNA polymerase movement, uh, is unwound properly so the poly-A signal can be recognized. Now, that's a, that's a very nice model, and there's no doubt that cenotaxin is involved in this process in RNA pol 2 transcription, but it doesn't really account for why you have progressive neurodegeneration in this disease. You would imagine that a ubiquitous process like transcription, if it was completely defective or was partially defective from an early age, which you would imagine it would be if, if this was the key role for cenotaxin, that that would result in a, a developmental defect, not simply a progressive degenerative defect that starts in early adolescence. So we wondered whether or not uh, the role of cenotaxin that accounts for its neuroprotective function might be more to do with unwinding our loops at other types of stalled RNA polymerase. And of course, the type of stalling I'm thinking about is the one I showed you on the previous slide, which is an RNA polymerase stalled at a site of damage. So we started to ask the question whether cenotaxin might actually be recruited to sites of DNA damage with a view to unwinding these DNA RNA, unwanted DNA RNA hybrids, these R loops. Uh, at sites of, of lesion. I'm not going to show you all of the data we've generated on this, but I just want to give you an example of some of the types of techniques that we actually use when we start looking and asking questions about whether a particular protein is involved in the DNA damage response or not. And one way we can do this is to take a human cell, express the GFT, a GFP tagged to protein of interest, in this case it's XLCC1, which we know is involved in single strand break repair, so this is just to illustrate the technique to you. We then damage the cell with a UVA laser in a particular position. Usually we put a stripe across the nucleus. And if the protein of interest is a DNA damage response protein, it will be recruited to that site of damage. And so, so this, is a, this is a movie now taken at 15 to 30 second intervals. And what you can see is the GFP tagged XLCC1 now accumulating at the stripe of chromosomal damage that we've introduced for the UVA laser. So that movie overall is about four to five minutes long. If we increase the amount of damage in the cell on the right, so this is a much higher dose of UVA laser, you can see we get a much faster accumulation of the protein at the site of damage, and to the point now where we start to deplete the protein from the nucleoplasm, and pretty much all of it starts to accumulate at the site of the damaged chromosomes. So we can do the same type of experiment with any protein of interest. In this case, we were asking a question about cenotaxin. And sure enough, when we look to see if cenotaxin was recruited at sites of DNA damage, we can see that it very clearly is. So cenotaxin looks like it's a DNA damage response protein. And we're now very interested in understanding the mechanism by which this RNA processing factor is recruited to sites of damage. And we have a number of protein interactions we've identified that we're pursuing to try and um, um, get a handle on that mechanism. So cenotaxin is interested for is interesting from another um, aspect as well, because cenotaxin, recessive mutations in cenotaxin, as I've mentioned, result in AOA2, ataxia ocular motor ataxia 2. Dominant mutations, however, have been identified in another neurological disease, which is motor neurone disease. So motor neurone disease uh, is accounted for by a variety in familial, familial motor neurone disease is accounted for by a variety of mutations in different genes, of which cenotaxin is one. So this is interesting because these mutations are autosomal dominant mutations. So recessive mutations in cenotaxin give a, um, a hereditary progressive neurological degeneration. Dominant mutations give motor neurone disease. And we don't understand why mutations in the same protein can give such two distinct neurological pathologies. But what this does suggest is that motor neurone disease may also have a component of altered DNA damage response and so we were interested in knowing whether any of the other genes associated with motor neurone disease, which of course is a much more common neurological problem in the aging population than the recessive ataxias that I've been talking about so far. Um, we want to know whether any of these genes might also be involved in the DNA damage response. And there were two genes of particular interest to us, two genes that had already been reported in the literature to be RNA processing factors. And they were uh, this protein FUS and this protein TDP43, both of which have as yet poorly characterized roles in RNA processing, um, but very clear roles, some involvement in that process, but mechanistically not very well characterized. So we conducted the same type of experiment, and sure enough, both GFP FUS and GFP tag TDP43 respond to sites of UVA laser induced damage. But interestingly, they do, do, do so in different ways. So, for example, FUS is recruited to sites of damage. 
within a few minutes, you can see here very quickly. Whereas TP43 appears to be immobile from the very beginning, so it's either part of the chromatin or part of the nuclear architecture, and is actually excluded from sites of UVA laser damage. So it's evicted from sites. So some proteins are recruited, and some proteins are evicted. And we're pursuing this now to try and understand how these RNA processing factors are, 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 um, uh, are working at sites of damage. And our working hypothesis is shown on this slide. What we have here is a DNA duplex with a single strand break. The RNA polymerase is stalled at this point. And we imagine you need to recruit DNA repair proteins. So each of these proteins is mutated in one of those recessive ataxias. If you lose them, you end up with these cerebellar degenerative ataxias. But now we also think that you need to recruit and control the location of RNA processing factors so that this nascent RNA emerging from the RNA polymerase is not prematurely spliced, is not destabilized or polyadenylated appropriately. And we think cenotaxin and fuzz are important to be recruited for that process, whereas TDP43 must to be evicted. However, mutation, dominant mutations in these proteins lead to motor neuron disease. So there are some clear, um, clearly important questions here. How can you have, for example, a recessive mutation in cenotaxin that gives rise to an ataxia, a dominant mutation that gives rise to motor neuron disease? And why is RNA processing um, uh, manifesting in, in this type of pathology, whereas our DNA repair proteins manifest in this recessive neurodegenerative pathology? And so this is a working hypothesis that, that we're um, investigating quite actively. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to double strand breaks and tell you a little bit about some work we've been doing on one particular type of double strand break and how that break is repaired, what we've learned about the repair of that break, and also what the consequences are to humans if you lose the ability to repair that break. And the source of double strand break I'm talking about is actually one that many of you will probably not be very familiar with. So in, your, in all cells, there, there is a, an enzyme called topoisomerase 2, and it's the role of topoisomerase 2 to remove torsional stress from DNA during metabolic processes such as replication, transcription, and also during cystochromatin separation and mitosis. To do that, topoisomerase 2 generates a transient double strand break. So this double strand break here is generated by the enzyme itself. The enzyme becomes covalently attached to the 5' prime end, this allows it to pass other segments of DNA through the break. And that's the way in which topoisomerase 2 removes torsional stress from chromosomes. At the end of its catalytic cycle, topoisomerase 2 will reseal the break itself, so it has a ligase activity. So it will transiently break DNA, remove torsional stress by passing segments of DNA through the break, and then reseal the break itself. That's all well and good. It's an essential part of the catalytic cycle of this enzyme. However, on occasion, the topoisomerase becomes trapped in an abortive configuration whereby it can no longer reseal that break. So you now have an abortive topoisomerase 2 complex with a double strand break that requires enzymatic DNA repair pathways to get rid of that break. Okay? So the occasional abortive activity of this enzyme results in potentially cytotoxic and clastogenic double strand breaks. We know these are a real threat to cells because this type of breakage is actually exploited during cancer therapy. So one class of commonly used anti-cancer chemotherapeutics work by poisoning the topoisomerase and preventing the topoisomerase from resealing the break, so thereby increasing the number of abortive uh, double-strand breaks, if you like. And one of those compounds is called atopicide, and I mention this specifically because we use atopicide in the laboratory to increase the level of these breaks in cells so we can measure how they're repaired, and what the consequences of those breaks are. And I will refer to a top side a number of times in the next few slides. So we exploit this, this uh, abortive activity of the enzyme for cancer therapy. It's also actually very important in carcinogenesis. So some of the commonest um, side effects of treating cancers with top two poisons are uh, resulting or subsequent leukemias that arise, treatment-related leukemias. And they arise because the, the atopicide we're using to kill the tumor is also, of course, generating double strand breaks in normal cells. And that some of those double strand breaks can go on to generate uh, translocations and generate secondary cancers. In actual fact, one of the commonest um, translocations occurring in prostate cancer, a fusion between TMPRSS2, which is a membrane-bound protease, and the ERG transcription factor, uh, 
accounts for more than 50% of all prostate cancer in men. And this is not induced by autophagy. This is a spontaneous event arising through spontaneous abortive activity of topisomerase 2 at these two genes, which then results in a subsequent translocation between those genes, generating a new oncoprotein that drives prostate cancer. So these breaks are actually highly significant, both in terms of um, treating cancers with drugs, but also in the spontaneous um, carcinogenic process, particularly in prostate cancer, certainly in other cancers as well. But these are very significant breaks. So a couple of years ago, we identified an enzyme called TDP2, whose specific role it is, is to recognize this linkage, this uh, damage terminus, this linkage between the topoisomerase and the five prime terminus of the break, so this is a covalent linkage, it's a phosphotyrosyl linkage, and this enzyme's job is to hydrolyze that linkage, liberating the terminus for DNA ligation. So very analogous to the sorts of events I talked about in the single strand break repair process. So what's nice about TDP2 is that it has no other known role in DNA repair. So we can assign any consequences um, to the loss of this protein to this particular loss of this particular repair event as far as we know. This is our current model for how this protein works and how these breaks are repaired. So here's the double strand break. The first event is you need to remove most of the topoisomerase from the break to give access to the terminus. So there's a proteolytic step here. TDP2 then recognizes this phosphotyrosyl linkage and hydrolyzes it. That liberates the termini. So now you have this nice chemistry I talked about, a three prime hydroxyl, five prime phosphate. And now we're talking about a double strand break, not a single strand break. And then a number of proteins that I'm not really going to talk about today come together to facilitate the ligation of this double-stranded end to generate a nice intact chromosome. And this is an error-free process. And the important thing is it's probably the only way in which this type of repair event can occur in an error-free fashion for reasons I'm not going to go into because of time constraints, mm -hmm. um, in an error-free fashion in non-proliferating cells. So we've been spending the last few years now trying to understand what happens in various model systems if you take TDP2 away from cultured cells, from mice, and the data I'm going to show you is actually from, from patients from human cells that we've been working on in the past few months. So we were quite fortunate in that we got involved in a collaboration with a group, Nymegan, who are, were very interested in a, a family with inherited intellectual uh, disability seizures and ataxia, so seizures and epilepsy have variable onset in this family. There's three affected bro um, brothers here. Seizures in one case started at three months, in a second 12 years, and another one two months, so variable age of onset. There's a taxi as well, which was, a, was a, a, a strong indication to us that there may be a DNA damage component to this. Total exome sequencing revealed that in these patients there was a potential, or was a mutation, in a potential splice site in exome 3 of TDP2. At this point, we became involved and collaborated with the group Nymegan to ask the question, was that mutation inactivating? Could we see a defect in the activity of this protein in these patients? And we have a very nice assay for detecting that. This is another commonly used technique in, in, in our lab. So what we generate here is a short oligonucleotide duplex. It's only 19 base pairs long. One strand is radio labeled with 32P. The other strand has this phosphotyrosyl linkage. So this just has the tyrosine link to the five prime end of the break, but this is exactly the same chemistry as in the endogenous bona fide top two double strand breaks. We can add our enzyme of choice. In this case, we're asking the question whether TDP2 activity is present, so we can add cell extracts from patients and normal cells to this substrate. If TDP2 is present, it will hydrolyze this bond, and now there will just be a five prime phosphate instead of a five prime phosphate and a tyrosine. And because this top strand is radio labeled, you can separate it by uh, gel electrophoresis, and the, the substrate for the tyrosine will migrate more slowly than the substrate for the phosphate. So it's a very easy way of detecting whether TDP2 is active. So, this is the result of one of our experiments. So this is blood. We've separated the white blood cells there from uh, control from the unaffected mother, from th the three brothers, and from a healthy sibling. And you can see here the position of the substrate bands. So this is this top strand. And you can see that if we now incubate with the extracts, then in the control, the mother and the healthy sibling see significant amounts of repaired product, which is this strand here where the tyrosine has been removed. But you see we don't see any activity in the patients. We can do a control reaction. We can look at the activity of a highly related enzyme, TDP1, 
I'm not going to tell you anything about this. This is one of the factors that's involved in single strand brain repair. But uh, TDP1 substrate is exactly the same chemistry, but the phosphatidylase linkage is on the three prime terminus, not on the five prime terminus. But TDP1 is highly specific for that chemistry on the three prime terminus, and you can see that TDP1 activity is perfectly normal in both the patients and the, norm, the healthy sibling and the mother. So this is a quality control to tell us that the extracts from the blood are working normally. There's nothing wrong with the extracts per se. It's just that there's a specific defect in the TDP2 activity. We can repeat those experiments with cultivated lymphoblastoid cells. So we can make lymphoblastoid cells from the blood from these individuals and we see the same result. The patients are defective, the controls are normal, but all of the uh, patients and controls have full TDP1 activity. So there's a specific defect in TDP2 in these patients. We can also confirm that using Western blotting. So if we have antibodies against TDP2, we can see that whereas the protein is present in the control extract, it's absent in the patients. TDP1 activity, uh, sorry, TDP1 protein on the other hand is present in all of them. So we see a very clear defect both in TDP2 protein levels and TDP2 activity in these individuals. So they really are defective in this activity. That defect translates into a repair defect. So one of the nice techniques we have in the lab is the ability to detect within a nucleus the presence of double strand breaks by the fact that it double strand breaks, that there is a modification of a particular histone that result a phosphorylation event results in a, um, a phosphohistone H2A that we can measure using antibodies. So each of these green blobs here is a double strand break. And so we can count the number of double strand breaks per nucleus and we can look at the rate at which those double strand breaks are repaired. In this case, these double strand breaks are in mouse embryonic fibroblasts. These are not the patient ones, this is just to illustrate the technique, but they're induced by a topicide. So each of these double strand breaks is one of these double strand breaks generated by the abortive activity of tocoisomerase 2. If we look at the repair of these breaks now in the human lymphoblastoid cells from either the patients shown in white or the normal cells shown in black, you can see there's a significant repair, double strand break repair defect in the lymphoblastoid cells from the patient. So the lack of TDP2 activity translates into a bona fide double strand break repair defect. That translates into a sensitivity as well. So if we now take the lymphoblastoid cells and cultivate them in the presence of a top, low levels of a topicide to increase the amount of topisomerase induced double strand breaks, we can see that the patient cells are unable to grow under those conditions whereas the normal cells will double quite well. So these are cell numbers, so it's a growth curve at these times in a topicide. Uh, if we grow either the normal or the patient cells in DMSO vehicle, then growth is perfectly normal in both cases. So the patient cells are selectively sensitive to the induction of these topisomerase 2 embrakes. And we can measure that in a different way. In a uh, with it, um, the graph on the left is measuring cell growth. The graph on the right is measuring the fold increase in dead cells using a metabolic assay, and you can see that increasing concentrations of topicide, the three bars where we see increasing death are in fact the three patients, the two normal controls are not affected by these concentrations of topicide. So the patient cells are both lack TDP2 activity, they are unable to repair uh, double strand breaks induced by topoisomerase 2, and consequently they are hypersensitive to treatment with the topicide. And that actually has consequences for these individuals should they develop cancer. Uh, that treatment with a topicide based therapies would not be a good idea for them. So the summary for, for this work then is that loss of TDP2 dependent double strand break repairs associated with seizures, intellectual disability and ataxia. And the critical uh, extrapolation of this is it suggests that the spontaneous abortive activity of topoisomerase 2 is sufficiently common in humans during its normal catalytic cycle that it goes wrong sufficiently frequently to actually be a significant threat to neural development and or maintenance in humans. And that you need the TDP2 and its associated repair function to protect the nervous system from the erroneous activity of this top white summarize. The reason, and this is the last slide, yeah, the, uh, the reason we think this is important comes back to transcription again. As I mentioned, top white summarize 2 is critical for removing torsional stress during DNA metabolic events such as transcription and replication. And in particular, transcription in the nervous system requires topoisomerase 2 beta, shown here. TS stands for transcription factor. So this is a gene now that's been transcribed. The initiations occur and the transcription factor has been recruited 
in a, uh, RNA polymerase 2 is present to drive transcription. You need the TOP isomerase to initiate transcription. That's known. Possibly because you have to remove torsional stress as the polymerase starts to move. More likely because you have to bring together the enhancer and promoter sequences to get, to get the initiation step to occur. And to do that requires moving bits of DNA around. So what we imagine is happening is that most of the time TOP isomerase 2 is going through its catalytic cycle and everything's fine, transcription's occurring, but occasionally um, the enzyme gets involved in one of these abortive reactions and the double strand break persists. At that point you need to recruit TDP2 and what TDP2 do, does is drive the repair of that double strand break and if you don't have TDP2 such as in this um, disease then it results in neural cell death in one of three possible ways we think. The first one is loss of critical transcripts so if this is an essential gene you will lose those transcripts until the double strand break is repaired so that could potentially kill neuron. There could be active signaling from this double strand break. There are enzymes that we know will recognize this and trigger cell death if the, if the break persists too long. The other consequence is not so much a cell death consequence, but it more relates to cancer. And I've sort of already argued and shown you evidence that, um, uh, that these breaks can generate chromosome exchanges and result in genetic instability in cancer if they persist too long. So in proliferating tissues, cancer is a likely outcome of, of, the, of loss of this protein, we imagine. Okay, so I'm going to skip this data because I overrun slightly. So general conclusions, and so these, it's quite hard to put a conclusion on this kind of talk because I've given you an overview of what we've been doing for the past 10 years and the direction the lab's moving in. But this sort of summarizes our working hypotheses and the sorts of questions that we're going to be addressing in the next five to 10 years. And hopefully some of these will be of interest to, um, to um, research groups in this university. So we know now that both unrepaired single strand breaks and double strand breaks are associated with neurodegeneration and neurodevelopmental defects. And the data that we're generating and others, other groups are generating suggests that this reflects an impact of these lesions on transcription in neurons. But there are differences between the way in which single strand breaks and double strand breaks might impact on transcription. Single strand breaks are at least three orders of magnitude more common than double strand breaks. We know that from a variety of sources, oxidative stress, Reactive oxygen species induce 2,000 times more single strand breaks than double strand breaks. So that means that for a moving RNA polymerase during transcript elongation, it's much more likely a single strand break will cause a problem than a double strand break, just because there are more of them. In addition to that, although double strand breaks theoretic theoretically could um, prevent elongation of an RNA polymerase, but encounters it, we know from the, the work I've shown you today that some double strand breaks, and in particular those arising from the abortive activity of top isomerase 2, are actually induced in promoter and enhancer sequences during the, the initiation part of transcription. So we know that in that case, these double strand breaks are uh, affecting transcription initiation and stopping transcription initiation if those breaks are not repaired. But in both cases, we think, and this point is dying a little bit, but in both cases, uh, single strand breaks and double strand breaks, we think, trigger cell death in neurons by either by preventing expression of essential genes, because you can't express and transcribe that gene if the break persists, whether it be a single or a double strand break, whether it be preventing initiation or elongation, or through active cell death signaling from those breaks. And this is a mechanism we're really interested in pursuing, because if we want to develop therapeutics to some of these diseases, the only way we're going to do it is by manipulating those cell death mechanisms. It would be very difficult to reinstate repair in these diseases. It would be much easier to stop neural cell death. Uh, and so that, that's an area that, we, that we're really interested in pursuing, is, is how active cell death might be triggered from the sites of block transcription. Okay, so I'll stop there, I'll run over a little bit. I just want to thank my lab, so this is my lab, this is the last lab barbecue in Sussex not quite as warm as it is here today, that's for sure. Um, the person who's conducted most of the work I've showed you is this chap here, Fernando. But also we have a very strong collaboration on the Top Wife Summaries 2 work with uh, Yannicka Schurz, Point Marcus, who works in the Nijmegen uh, Medical Centre. Uh, and our funding bodies are the Medical Research Council in the UK, so this is the government funding agency. BBSRC is another government funding agency and a charity, Cancer Research UK, who funds our genome instability work. That I'll stop. And take any questions?
Can you use the mic? Sorry. There's an air conditioner back here, yeah. so you can't. So, thank you for your very nice talk. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, um, you, you've shown that the downstream of TTP2 is non homologous and joining. So, would you expect um, if you inhibit NHEJ, such as like the NPK inhibitor, would it be um, additive or is it epistasis in the TTP2 um, deficient cells? Yeah, so we, we have done those experiments, and those, those are published earlier this year. So we see an epistatic relationship. If we mutate um, Ku, for example, we haven't done in APK, if you mutate Ku, in addition to TDP2, the phenotype is exactly the same as either single mutant. So there's no additive effect, and there's an epistatic relationship. Okay. And the second question is, um, is there any way, let's say, if you can, if you could bypass the NHEJ or suppress the NHEJ, and would it be take over by Hanukkah through combination? Can it take place in this situation? Yeah, that's another good question. That's also true as well. So where, where is it possible to make um, mutants in both TDP2 and other components of, of not NHEJ? We've not been able to generate a viable cell that lacks a TDP2 and a component of homologous recombination. And cells that lack TDP2 seem to show upregulated levels of homologous recombination. So we think that homologous recombination is one of the backup pathways that repairs some of the breaks that um, uh, TDP2 would normally repair. Thank you.